Hello and welcome to the presentation on what, how and where ESG data is used. My name is Michael Salvatico and I'm the head of Asia Pacific Sustainable One Business Development for S&P Global. For more than a decade, I've been providing sustainable solutions to investors, banks, corporates, regulators and governments. I've been working with these organisations to better benchmark, report, engage, analyse and model ESG risks and opportunities. A key focus of mine for many years has been on climate risk, analysis and reporting on baseline footprinting and scenario analysis. In this presentation, I will cover the ESG for the needs of a wide user segment. So this presentation is relevant to you if you are an investor, a bank, corporate, a regulator, a government, academic, or someone with an interest in sustainability. There are three themes I'll address, key themes for 2021. The standardization of metrics to measure ESG, SDGs and climate change. The need for greater transparency of reporting for corporates and financial institutions. And the global focus on climate change resilience and net zero. S&P Global is in a good position to provide these insights. S&P Global is the leading provider of environmental, social and governance solutions to help optimize long-term stakeholder value. We have invested in and continue to pursue solutions to help customers mitigate ESG risks and identify related growth opportunities. S&P Global has over 100 years experience and innovation. Important for this presentation topic, S&P Global has integrated two of the best known ESG data and analytics providers, TrueCost and SAM, into our market leading family of credit ratings, index provision, commodities pricing, and financial information. S&P Global works with a broad range of clients across the economy and is trusted by market leaders, disruptors and visionaries, including AXA, Unilever, Samsung, Citi and Uber, just to name a few. S&P Global strives to be the standard we are well recognised by awards from ESG Investing, Asia Asset Management, Environmental Finance. The leadership is recognised by market activity. For example, S&P Global ESG ETF assets under management increased more than 400% from Q1 last year to Q1 this year. S&P Global works with and is a member of a range of industry leading associations, including the Natural Capital Coalition, UNEP FI, CDP and PRI. S&P Global licenses the ESG data used here so that you can analyse and report your ESG and climate exposures. In the next few slides, I'll cover what information is being disclosed and why, what are the benefits and concerns for companies, where and what reporting is mandatory, how is ESG data used by corporate and financial institutions, and a focus on S&P Global ESG analysis and how it solves for your ESG needs. But before I start, let me remind us all of why we are here. Today, business as usual is making our planet unlivable. This is a quote from the World Economic Forum. For me, this is summed up by the angry fish. My daughter and I recently bought the painting that you see as a reminder of mankind's impact on the oceans and planet. We call it the angry fish. It is about a meter square and the fish covers most of the canvas. It looks angry. It's angry because it's being painted on plastic rubbish. The artist collects plastic bags washed up on beaches around the world and incorporates them into the painting. The World Economic Forum forecasts the oceans will have more plastic waste than fish by 2050. This is a result of human waste. The health of the ocean is intimately tied to our health. Over 3 billion people depend on marine and coastal biodiversity for their livelihoods. Coastal waters are deteriorating due to pollution and eutrophication. Without concentrated efforts, coastal eutrophication is expected to increase in 20% of large marine ecosystems by 2050. At the same time, we know that 2.2 billion people lack safely managed drinking water and 4.2 billion people lack safely managed sanitation. 3 billion people lack basic hand washing facilities at home. These are just a few facts about 
Sustainable Development Goal 6 for clean water and sanitation, and SDG 14, Life Below Water. Companies play a major role in transitioning the global economy to be more sustainable, equitable, and SDG aligned. It benefits everyone's future. The artist is doing his part to change the world through art. I ask myself, how am I doing my part? Do you? Let's review what is being disclosed and why. One thing is clear, nowadays there is more data being disclosed and the key reason is the demand from stakeholders. A growing number of companies and financial institutions are disclosing information on their environmental, social and governance policies, procedures, exposures and performance in corporate sustainability assessment, in sustainability and TCFD reports. This includes information on their climate risk exposure, such as the scope one, scope two and scope three carbon emissions as part of their operational footprint. The information disclosed covers the company operations and supply chain. In some cases, the analysis covers the full value chain, such as with the S&P Global SDG Risk Assessment. A key disclosure of climate risk is scenario analysis of transition and physical risks. This information can be used to inform company targets. One target that is growing in attention is the target to align to a 1.5 degree carbon emissions trajectory. The credibility of this target is increased with the science-based targets initiative. Important transparency and salient data supports investors and companies to understand exposure to climate risk and capture vital insights to inform their strategy to secure a sustainable future. The market is indicating strong support for disclosures and S&P Global Sustainable One. We have seen a threefold increase in the number of companies undertaking TCFD reporting projects compared to this time last year. The demand continues to rise for comparable and consistent scenario analysis to enable companies to unlock capital and support investors in their portfolio strategies as they seek to align with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Let's consider it from a company perspective, both the benefits and the concerns of disclosing ESG and climate data. To give a balanced view, I'll start with the concerns. The concerns I hear include the risks of sharing competitive or sensitive information, the cost of resources and efforts involved in collecting and reporting on ESG information, and the concerns of publishing weak metrics. These concerns are addressed by the increasing regulation on reporting guidance and the requirements that standardise disclosure and levels of, of which level the playing field. Secondly, if companies do not disclose ESG and climate information, then it is being estimated. By being estimated, it is out of control of the company and the company is less likely to benefit from any positives. Thirdly, a weak metric highlights an opportunity to improve and take advantage of the benefits to the broader organisation. The benefits to companies of sustainability data are broad across the organisation, starting with better governance and more informed strategies. This impacts the company's operations, products and services, and evidence shows it creates more resilient and profitable companies in the longer term. The recently launched Confusion and Clarity report indicates the benefits for companies include market access to global trade, better access to capital and superior performance. It starts here with sustainability reporting, improving the company's understanding of risks and opportunities and leads to better relationships with stakeholders through the supply chain, with investors through more informed, productive engagement. A key focus has become the transition to net zero and the need to rapidly decarbonize in order to limit damaging climate change. Companies' sustainability efforts can lead to greater financing opportunities through green bonds and sustainability linked loans, as well as greater capital raising potential through inclusion in sustainable indices. Let's look at the drivers for ESG and climate analysis and disclosure in the next slide. In the next few slides, I want to highlight the trend that has seen ESG and climate change become mainstream. I've been asked if this is a bubble and if it will burst. 
I say no, it's not. Given the weight of progress and the number of initiatives I, in which I play, I cannot see the trend stopping or the momentum slowing for any continued period of time. My personal view is that we are at a pivotal time in the history of finance, education and economics. The change is from the ground up. Consumers demanding greater corporate responsibility and the expectations for how funds are invested and used has taken a sustainable tilt. Surveys show 85% of the general population are interested in sustainable investing and 86% believe companies embracing these ESG practices may potentially be more profitable and may be long, better longer term investments. That's four, more than four in every five people. The urgency to address climate change has been acknowledged by regulators and exchanges. 50 central banks and supervisors are taking the environment into account and 17 consider assessing climate risk as a financial risk in stress testing. Australia, China, Singapore, Hong Kong and New Zealand are some examples of countries where regulators have provided guidance on assessing climate risk where it is material. China and New Zealand have indicated mandatory reporting in the near future. And in Australia, a recent paper released by IGCC and co-authors presents a strong case for mandatory reporting in Australia. The report, Confusion to Clarity, refers specifically to Australian regulators, but the learnings for companies and investors apply to other economies. More than 2,000 governments and businesses appear to have taken the net zero pledge. The United Nations Race to Zero campaign, for example, indicates a coalition of about 1,675 businesses, 85 large investors and more than 400 70 cities. This is an incredible number when you consider the concept of net zero is very recent. It demonstrates the recognition of climate emergency. At the end of 2020, the United Nations found that countries representing more than 65% of global emissions and more than 70% of the world economy had committed to net zero, with the US more recently adding its own pledge. The European Union, New Zealand, Japan and the Republic of Korea, together with more than 110 other countries, have pledged carbon neutrality by 2050. China indicates it will do so by 2060. Stock exchanges have been active in recognising the importance of ESG and climate change reporting, with 60 exchanges globally providing guidance and 25 exchanges mandating reporting requirements. I was personally present at the Australian Stock Exchange when the fourth edition of the Corporate Governance Principles and Recommendations was launched. One other area and aspect of the climate change agenda has been that companies and financial institutions' uh, legal perspective. In Australia, the Hutley opinion provides strong guidance for companies and asset owners on the need to consider climate change risks, where those risks are material to the organisation, or benefits uh, to the financial interests of a beneficiary. Let's look at other indicators of reporting on the next slide. Another way to measure the momentum of adoption of ESG and climate change is the commitment to industry bodies and associations such as TCFD, which has grown to more than 2,200 supporters. Asia is well represented at 34% of the supporters and TCFD represents a framework for climate change risk and opportunities reporting that includes governance, strategy, risk management metrics and targets. TCFD is the framework being referenced in reporting guidance and mandatory reporting requirements. The UNPRI now captures $103 trillion in assets under management by more than 3,600 signatories and that's increasing. The signatories have adopted the six principles to incorporate ESG issues into their investments, analysis and policies, to disclose ESG issues, to promote the principles, to work together and report on activities. These are serious commitments to promote ESG outcomes over the long term. Science-based targets is another fast growing initiative. The science-based targets provide companies with a clearly defined path to reduce emissions in line with the Paris Agreement goals. In my view, science exposed climate change and so science should be science should be the measure by which companies' efforts to align carbon emissions are assessed. 
Science-based targets provides assessments, guidelines for companies to set targets that are credible and robust. S&P Global has set science-based targets consistent with reductions required to keep warming to 1.5 degrees. In addition, S&P Global has made commitments to ensure suppliers will have science-based targets by 2025. The Sustainable One analysis of Paris alignment employs the science-based targets recommended approaches of SDA and GIVA to assess the trajectories of companies and financial institutions portfolios to a 1.5 degree world. These are not the only changes that indicate a greater focus on responsibility of companies and financial institutions to incorporate sustainability. I feel strongly about the news from the US Business Roundtable that acknowledged the significance and permanence of change in the community attitudes and values. In 2019, it changed its core principle that the paramount duty of boards and management is to their shareholders. It's now broadened that duty to include all stakeholders and issues such as diversity, social inclusion, and the environment. Though these regulatory exchange and, and groups indicate good momentum and progress, there is still a lot of work to do. The number of low, low S&P global ESG scores indicates there is a long way to go for many companies to achieve strong ESG credentials. The world needs to rapidly transition to a low carbon future or face the consequences of damaging global warming. For example, major global companies could face up to $283 billion in carbon pricing costs with 13% of earnings at risk by 2025 under a high carbon price scenario as analyzed by true cost carbon earnings at risk. S&P Global's Paris alignment assessment shows that major global companies are on track for a greater than three degree warming scenario they fall 72% short of the required emissions reductions needed to achieve the Paris Agreement goal. In a recent S&P survey, almost 50% of respondents had not yet considered TCFD reporting. And limiting warming to a two degree scenario by 2050 will require $3 trillion annually in investment, according to estimates by the IPCC. Moreover, as Climate, physical climate risks are intensifying and our research shows that 66% of major companies have at least one asset at risk from physical impacts of climate change. There are also concerns about greenwashing. All this requires a greater focus on solutions to quantify the ESG and climate risks that are robust, that are credible, consistent and comparable. A standard needs to be set. Let's take a look at more de in more detail at how ESG data is used. So we've gone through the what is being disclosed, the benefits and the why. Let's have a look at how ESG data is being used. Whether you're a corporate, an asset manager, an asset owner, a bank or an insurer, your use case for ESG data is encapsulated by benchmarking, reporting, engagement analysis and modelling. Let me share some examples. Corporates are collecting, calculating and analysing climate risks and opportunities. The results are used to inform risk management and guide strategic direction. The results can be published in line with TCFD reporting recommendations. Corporates can also collect ESG performance data to set goals and measure progress. Reporting on improving and strong ESG credentials can be used to help attract and retain talent, improve upon health and safety, and provide better products and better services to customers. Active fundamental and quantitative investors use ESG data and climate data to de-risk portfolios and identify opportunities with the aim to capture ESG alpha. Asset managers and owners use ESG and climate benchmarks like the S&P Global ESG Indices, Net Zero Indices, Carbon Efficient Indices or Clean Energy Indices to capture themes or potentially replace market cap weighted benchmarks. A use case is asset owners engagement of asset managers or corporates engagement on ESG and climate change exposure. And where engagement does not succeed, the data may be used to inform proxy voting. Investors report on their portfolio or fund level ESG and climate risk exposures internally and externally. The SFDR assessment of portfolios provides a measure of ESG credentials 
and addresses greenwashing. At some of my clients, the internal analysis is reviewed at the board level. ESG and climate change data forms one aspect of a manager's assessment of a company, portfolio and fund. By no means am I recommending it be the only factor. The assessment and valuation of metrics and investment styles, whether that's growth, whether it's quality or yield, remain a measure for investment. And this highlights the benefit of an integrated data platform such as S&P Global CapIQ Pro, which captures both the fundamental data and ESG data in one place. Banks use ESG data to assess their risk management, credit risk assessment or loan book exposures. Banks incorporating climate risk in lending process either as part of the credit assessment or as a specific product, be that a sustainability linked loan or a green bond, for example. The stress testing of loan books has become a major focus and involves the use of climate change data and scenarios. The assessments are guided by frameworks such as PCAF and NGFS. The second section of this presentation will highlight more details on climate risk assessment, so I won't spend much more time here. Note that the analysis of these carbon emissions and assessment against carbon emissions trajectories forms part of the assessment process for science-based targets and the net zero pathway. You will see on the right, a list of global S&P global solutions. These do apply to the data cases here, but rather than review this list on this slide, let's go to the next slide, which has greater detail. So now that we've talked through how ESG data is used by different segments of the economy, let's have a look at some of the data analytics reporting solutions available to you through S&P Global Market Intelligence. First, you will see that Market Intelligence provides ESG and climate change solutions for financial institutions and for corporates. The solutions cover the spectrum of ESG scoring, climate risk and opportunity assessments. Companies and financial institutions are using true cost intelligence to understand their ESG exposure, inform resilience and identify transformative solutions for a more successful, sustainable global economy. We combine science-based data, economic models and financial analysis to deliver business focused ESG insights. Working with companies and financial institutions provides insights into the nuances of a company's operations and value chain. We can apply those learnings to scale deficit data sets for financial institutions. This helps create standardization across the value chain of corporate and finances. Focusing on the climate data in the first instance, the climate data is built on 20 years of experience from TrueCost. TrueCost is a leader in carbon and environmental data and risk analytics. TrueCost assesses risks relating to climate change, natural resources, and to climate economics. TrueCost standardizes and validates the world's most comprehensive environmental performance data, covering more than 15,000 listed companies and 5,000 private companies, representing 99% of global market capitalization. And through market intelligence data, this can be mapped to 954,000 related companies, 8.6 million fixed income ISINs, and 15 million structured products and warrants. These ESG solutions include award-winning corporate sustainability assessment, a unique proactive survey completed by companies and covering 100 questions and collecting 1,000 data points. The survey helps guide corporates understand the current future and future ESG needs of investors. And the CSA informs ESG scores used to benchmark company performance and inform financial institutions. On the corporate reporting list of analysis tools and reports, you will see operational footprints calculations of scope one, scope two and scope three emissions. We have deep data sets that allow us to calculate those emissions from, from invoices. And the physical risk reports analyze company assets by asset type and GPS coordinate, providing a raw score 
assessment to seven hazards or for three scenarios across different time periods. The Sustainable Development Goal Evaluation assesses the organisation against the 169 targets that make up the 17 goals. And these are just a few examples. From the long list of services provided to financial institutions and multiple delivery options, you can see that we are working to solve for your ESG and climate change assessment needs in a way that meets your workflow. Whether it's ESG or climate change solutions, we have been working with you for more than 20 years. One area that's resurfacing as an important consideration is carbon footprinting. The growing user case for carbon footprinting, such as engagement, transition scenario analysis, and net zero assessment, as well as changing guidelines such as PCAF, mean that there is a need to have greater care on the quality and calculation of those footprints. Since publishing the first carbon audit of a portfolio in 2005, we, we've been pioneers of portfolio environmental analytics and carbon footprinting. And today, our uniquely comprehensive analytics select set covers all asset classes and a range of metrics. While there's a lot here, we're not stopping. Uh, we continue to work with industry leaders, organisations and clients to innovate and enhance our solutions. Already, our physical risk analysis covers 3 million assets in, in our standard data set, and that's growing. The synergies with the deep data sets of market intelligence continue to be accessed and the climate modelling applied to, the, to more companies. The market intelligence data set covers more than 60,000 listed companies and 17 million private companies. So there's, there's huge potential. In my last slide for this presentation, I'd like to bring together all the ESG and climate solutions across S&P Global in one place. Many of you would know parts of S&P Global, but I want to make sure you know the full picture. S&P Global is a very large company. We have the world's largest credit rating agency, S&P Global Ratings. We have S&P Global Market Intelligence, which offers analytics, financial point of time information, ESG and climate data, and portfolio tools, earnings estimates, asset level data across thousands of listed companies and millions of private companies to market participants. We have the largest index business with S&P Dow Jones indices, and we have S&P Global Platts, which provides pricing benchmarks across energy commodities. As of this year, I represent Sustainable One, which supports the ESG solutions across these businesses. And my team represents the combination of ESG solutions across S&P Global, bringing together a holistic, market-wide and value chain deep set of ratings, indices, data, analytics, reports, and pricing to meet the breadth of customer requirements. A one-stop data shop. The synergies across these solutions benefits you whether you are a company, a bank, an investor, a regulator, or an academic. As you look across the solutions from ESG evaluations, ESG scores, ESG indices, and energy transition, I want you to think of your business needs. For instance, if you're a company, and you would, then you would benefit from energy transition reporting and forecasting from our Platts business, providing pricing and volumes of energy production from fossil fuels and renewables or the pricing of carbon credits, green hydrogen, zero carbon aluminium for some examples. From there, as a company, you may wish to issue green bonds or use a net benefits report to substantiate the carbon emissions and water savings. Then use a green evaluation to provide a relative green impact score. It can also provide a second opinion for your transactions alignment with the green bond principles or green loan principles. As a company, you may want to have stronger ESG credentials and have your S&P Global calculate your Scope 1, Scope 2 and Scope 3 emissions. Use this in preparation of an ESG disclosure report and then complete the Corporate Sustainability Assessment, which is used by ratings in ESG evaluation and market intelligence to inform the ESG scores and index as a factor in the S&P Global, uh, Global ESG indices. If you're an investor, you may use the market intelligence platform to inform your views on ESG through news feeds or the ESG Insider podcast. 
You can add ESG and climate factors to your financial data in, in a screen that you export. You can visualize the ESG score trends, carbon emissions, carbon earnings at risk, physical risk, or Paris alignment of a company in your portfolio. Or you could use a net zero index to benchmark your strategy or have a full TCFD portfolio assessment prepared. And these are in-depth reports that can sometimes be more than 72 pages. If you're a bank, you probably want to understand your loan book climate risks as these are likely the greatest climate risks. You can use market intelligence data or you can have a TCFD aligned report prepared for you by Sustainable One team, covering transition and physical risks. As a bank, you may need to include climate risk in risk management and credit risk assessments. S&P Global have a spectrum of climate risk solutions from ESG scorecards to complete climate credit analytics models. And these are created in partnership with Oliver Wyman. That is a good segue to my colleague's section. Speaking after me is Priyana Devicha, the product specialist for credit risk solutions. So with that, I thank you all very much for your attention and hope you did come away with a greater insight on the standardized approaches, the transparency and criticalness to meet ESG objectives and reduce damaging climate change. I hope that you see a solution for your analysis and reporting needs and that net zero is a discussion we can help you with. I hope to see you at my next event. Thank you and over to you, Prina. Thank you, Michael, and good day, everyone. My name is Prerna Devecha, and I'm the Senior Director within the Asia Pacific Credit Product Specialist Group at S&P Global Market Intelligence. Over the next 10 minutes, I will be focusing on how we can assist financial institutions in quantifying the impact of climate risk in credit risk. And herein, we must not forget the opportunities that it presents as well. In the following slides, we will go through some of the challenges commonly faced in doing so and how we can address these. We all must admit that there is an overarching theme of uncertainty given the climate transition is a new kind of risk that we're having to deal with. And this also applies in the case of estimating the credit risk impact of climate change for several reasons. And I've listed that on this slide. On the data side, companies need granular information on carbon emissions and on the assets geolocation for firms that they're exposed to. Carbon emissions are often not reported in a standardized way or not reported at all, especially for smaller companies. So availability of a large standardized data set can become critical. And it is difficult to then create relevant benchmarks or estimates that can be scaled by company size. With regards to geolocation of assets, one can refer to a large database such as the S&Ps and uh, perform a mapping exercise to identify major climate risks, physical risk events, sometimes multiple with different impacts. The transition to a carbon um, economy that is low is influenced obviously by carbon tax levels with differing levels, not only by country and industry, but also by the speed of carbon tax evolution over the next 30 years. So essentially we're talking about very long-term horizons, which much depend beyond conventional stress testing horizons. At the same time, being able to integrate transition risks in short term as the impact of transition may start to materialize faster than we assume, which then can also require modeling capabilities that support less orderly transitions. And then this is not all, because much depends on how companies will respond to carbon tax hikes. For example, will they maintain VAU or rather invest into greener technology um, and it's in a sense face higher abatement costs initially, but then assessing bigger growth potential and market share in the future and thereby paying less carbon taxes in the long run. So assessing these alternate paths for future counterparty behavior and understanding implications on full financial statements um, in order that we can gain a, a full 360 degree view will require sound financial assumptions 
um, different impacts on production of goods, elasticity of demand in order to uh, respond to these price changes, assumptions on adaptation versus business as usual, asset stranding, and I can go on. So how can we link credit risk and the opportunities with so many uncertainties? Well, there is no established methodology yet, and especially for transition risk, there is not even a direct way to backtest the results because after all, this is a transition that we're doing for the first time. So on the next slide, we will touch upon a broad modeling framework that can address this. Here, the good news is that in case um, there is a scenario-based framework that can become very useful to estimate potential outcomes given the heightened uncertainty and, and um, risks. The idea is to start from the current credit worthiness of the company and then assess how this can be impacted by various shocks coming from the transition and physical risk events, and ultimately from the overall macroeconomic considerations as well. In this slide, we shall focus not only on the climate risk related portion, as there are already well established techniques that link um, credit or defaults to business and financial risk. Here and instead, we'll focus on the relevant scenario variables, for example, the carbon tax or the temperature pathways, and then establish its impact on intermediate company level drivers, such as costs, revenues, capital expenditure, and assets, or for example, se sector specific drivers, such as oil prices, production costs, and then finally translate them into the financial impact that can be used in usual credit risk models. In terms of the financial impact, one can use a fundamental driven approach or a market driven approach. The fundamental analysis looks at conditioning the full financial statements of a company on those drivers. This typical type of approach is very well ingrained in banks, processes, as well as provides a detailed and more granular view. One of the challenges though of this approach is that it's not easily applicable to private companies that report only incomplete and often limited set of financials because there is that need to utilize a lot of assumptions to derive the necessary outcomes and it's more bottoms up in nature. The second approach on the other hand includes a market valuation technique that estimates the future market capitalization of companies based on their future earnings. The market capitalization impact is then translated into a credit score change with advanced Merton-like credit models. The advantage of this approach is that it requires few assumptions and can be applied as a comparable framework approach across all sectors. It can build so easily expanded um, and expand to private companies um, and with an appropriate estimation of their implied market capitalization. On the flip side though, it certainly is not as detailed and a full bottoms up approach. In a sense, both approaches can be, can be used for a variety of complementary use cases, for example, for larger exposures, um, especially in carbon emitting intensive sectors. Um, the fundamental approach uh, enables a deep dive analysis on financial impact. On the other hand, for a varied portfolio, including several thousands of exposures, the market valuation approach provides a consistent, quick, and scalable view of the impact. So accordingly at S&P Global Market Intelligence, we've developed two tools to assess and to assist linking in particular the transition risk and opportunities to credit risk. On the next slide, we will go through both of these tools. On the left side, you see climate credit analytics. This uses a fundamentals driven approach, which was developed in collaboration with Oliver Wyman and it leverages S&P Global Market Intelligence's specific granular data sets on company financials, as well as on company specific sector specific metrics, such as production volumes, type of goods produced, the asset location, as well as S&P's carbon emissions data. As a result of this, we can get into the full financial impact and the statements of each companies. The solution also provides a mean level extrapolation module within each model to project likely impacts for companies where the required financial data is missing. 
but with some baseline credit risk information. Comprehensive counterparty or portfolio level analysis is possible with this tool via a bottoms up approach comprising six distinct models that include five energy intensive sectors such as oil and gas, metals and mining, power generation, automotive and airlines, plus a generic or a universal model for the remaining sectors. This may be analyzed under various predefined scenarios such as the NGFS, remind or the message scenarios um, and the user can also apply their customized scenarios all the way up to 2050 or evaluate disorderly transition shocks over the shorter time frames like what happens perhaps in the next three years if all of a sudden there is a change in uh, policy by governments and by regulators the tool on the right side um, is climate risk gauge it adopts a more consistent framework, which is market valuation driven across countries and industries and leverages S&P's carbon emissions and energy transition scenarios. And then additionally also captures multiple aspects, including competitive dynamics among companies operating in the same sector. All of this makes it particularly suitable for analyzing portfolio effects as such. So in general, if you look at both tools, the output a credit score that, um, that, that is a change that can be applied on top of current credit scores from S&P Global Market Intelligence credit statistical models, or it can also be used to notch up or down the output from the user's own internal credit models. There's also another reason that makes the use of both the fundamentals driven as well as the market valuation approach complementary to each other. And this relates to model risk. Of course, the two tools that we've developed provide different outputs for the same company because they are driven by different underlying assumptions and analytical frameworks. So using both, one can start comparing the results driven by the different assumptions, scenarios, and approaches, which further helps in embracing the uncertainty that we spoke of earlier. Um, I hope you've now got a good understanding of an overview of how climate risk can be translated into an impact on credit risk. And with this, I thank you for your time and attention. Have a good day ahead. Great. Uh, thanks, Pruna, for that presentation on the, the credit risk assessment guide. There's a, a number of questions. Uh, it, it's great to see the, the questions coming through. I'm going to answer them quickly. We have uh, we have five minutes for questions. So, um, how can a regulator benefit from the tools available on S and P? Uh, so, the the tools that we looked at were focused on identifying risk. So, if we understand, uh, especially climate change, where there is a great certainty around the risks from climate change impacting material on companies, on banks, uh, on investors then regulators benefit from understanding uh, those risks and measuring those risks and being able to have greater insight on the risk exposures uh, in their economies, regulatory economies. So uh, there's been a greater focus on climate risk, certainly the transition risk from a carbon pricing shock or the Paris alignment uh, as much as there has been a uh, focus on physical risks, uh, because those are the risks that are uh, the result of natural hazards. And, and we've seen uh, we've seen evidence of these risks, whether it's wildfires uh, in Australia or California, uh, or whether it's heat waves um, across uh, Europe uh, and across the North Americas, or whether it's uh, floods. Uh, that we're seeing in Europe at the moment, Germany and, and Belgium. Uh, I'll keep going with questions. Uh, do any of these ESG tools address the MSME segment? And I'm taking taking that to acronym to mean the small to medium uh, segment. Uh, they're, they're currently the tools that have coverage of the MSME segment are carbon footprinting and the physical risk analysis. Physical risk analysis uh, covers over 100,000 companies across 3 million assets. Uh, we are looking to expand uh, these data sets out 
and uh, the modelling around carbon earnings at risk. It is possible to model carbon earnings at risk uh, for a, um, a, a custom set of companies. Uh, what, what companies are doing a great job in their sustainability strategy and initiatives, uh, it depends on the, the type of initiative and strategy, whether that's an ESG strategy. Uh, for instance, if you're looking at the overall ESG score, you could see on our website, uh, that there's, um, there's, there's companies like uh, the Thai Beverage Public Company, for one that's in Asia-Pac, that has uh, one of the highest ESG scores uh, uh, out of um, the companies that we cover. Uh, similarly, if, you, if you're looking at TCFD reporting uh, and reporting on uh, scenario analysis, uh, or if you're looking at companies that uh, have uh, greater disclosure across uh, their sustainability strategies uh, through TCFD reporting. Uh, something that um, something that we see uh, in uh, in the S and P TCFD report, for instance. Uh, Aprina, uh, there are some questions here for you. I'm, I'm I'm happy to pass over to your questions. There's still a few more here for me as well. So. Uh, do you have access to to um, the questions in the the video and and Mike? Hi, yes, Michael, I do. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I, I do see a question on how does um, climate credit analytics incorporate information on companies' um, evolving business models and transition. So. Um, that's um, certainly an interesting one. Um, so the tool Climate Credit Analytics um, will reflect company transition strategies um, to the extent they're reflected already in the financial statements of the company. So that's one way. Um, another way is as companies update their strategies over time, the tool will bring in new baseline information that reflects these strategies. Um, and there is also an option in the model itself to designate the company's carbon price in the short-term scenarios. So users with information on the counterparty's internal pricing on carbon could also input that value into climate credit analytics. I, I, I'd say last but not the least here, um, in some of the models, um, such as power generation and automotive, the models also consider where companies are in their investment path. So if their current investment path um, is static and um, you know is uh, going to uh, therefore not invest further in green technologies at a lower market share um, in the static case, uh, whereas companies that are more adaptive in their product mix and wanting to maintain market share uh, will move to more of an adaptive um, approach within the model um, and be able to invest in green technologies and maintain market share over time. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, Prina. We've, we've kind of come to time. There is one more question here, which I'm going to jump in. And uh, the, the listener asks, um, what do we see as the new developments in other areas of ESG, such as biodiversity? What a great question. We are looking at biodiversity right now and understand, better understanding how biodiversity affects companies in terms of the inputs into their organisation. Uh, we know uh, that 50% uh, of global GDP is reliant on uh, biodiversity, and so this is an area that we're, we're currently uh, investigating and look forward to having analysis that we can be sharing with our clients soon. Uh, so with, with that, Prina, we've, we've hit the, um, hit the hour. Um, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been great. I've really enjoyed this session. So thank you um, for your presentation. I hope, um, hope everyone enjoyed my presentation as well. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all at uh, the, the next session and next event that I get to present at as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.